Okay, we'll trip to the end. And I'm not the least surprised that Paulette draws such a wonderful crowd. Um, I'm meant to tell you soon. For two more months. I'm <laughs> 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 uh, I am delighted to welcome you to this gallery talk for Paulette Werger's exhibition, Animal, Vegetable, Mineral. Well, it was a good day for Eva when Paulette and Eric moved to Lebanon 13 years ago. And it was an even better day for Eva when Paulette soon afterwards moved into a studio in this very building. Since then, she has not stopped contributing to Eva in the most amazing ways. From making the best chocolate-covered strawberries ever to be, saved, to be saved at opening the receptions, to serving as chair of the Eva board, from being on task alarm systems call list, <laughs> resulting in 3 a.m. rendezvous with the Lebanon police in the parking lot, okay, to, most recently, so capably, having Ava's search committee that assisted by a national search firm resulted just about a month ago in the selection of Ava's next executive director, Trip Anderson, who is here with us tonight. <laughs> but first and foremost, Paulette is a most talented, innovative and amazing metal artist. As you can see, perhaps, I am actually completely smitten by her work. <laughs> I don't think there is a day when I am not wearing one of her exquisite pieces. And she always manages to make her creativity benefit Eva. Okay, so 100% of the proceeds for the sale of this necklace, for example. And I'm shameless now. <laughs> I bought this as soon as the exhibition opened because it benefits our current capital campaign. Look around, there are many other pieces in this show identified as benefiting the Catholic campaign if you make a purchase. Thank you, Paulette. Um, it is so appropriate that it will benefit our new sculptural studies building which is nearing its completion. Who better to be an ardent supporter of this facility than Paulette? She has been instrumental in the planning of it and in the fundraising, and will continue to be instrumental with her creative ideas once the exhibition officially, or once the building officially opens. And I am sure she will bring chocolate-covered strawberries or perhaps even homemade truffles to the opening because no matter what Paulette does, she always sweetens the deal, ever so often. Thank you. And now, oops, Margaret. Now our exhibition director, Margaret Jacobs, will give a more formal and proper introduction <laughs> of Paulette's numerous professional accomplishments. Thank you. received her bachelor's in painting and sculpture from the College of St. Rose and Skidmore College in New York, and her MFA in art metal from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Worker exhibits and sells her work both nationally and internationally, and teaches workshops in jewelry making and metal smithing techniques. In 2007, she was visiting artist at the Clackman Jewelry Studio at Dartmouth College, and in 2008, she was a Dayton Hudson visiting scholar at Carleton College. Worker has exhibited wildly including at the Chazen Museum of Art in Madison, Wisconsin, the Renwick Gallery of Craft in Washington, D.C., and at the Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts. Her awards include a recent niche award from American Craft Marketing, a New Hampshire Remarkable Woman Award from New Hampshire Magazine, and the Joe Tucker Medal Award from the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. Please join me in welcoming Paulette. Weird <laughs> because 
I, I had this vision this morning that I was just going to, you know, have my PowerPoint and there'd be maybe five people here. So thanks, everybody. I uh, did not expect this turnout, and thanks, everybody, for coming. This is lovely. Um, I'm going to launch. There's a couple of things I want to do is to just sort of give you points of contact and the connective tissue, kind of why this show is called Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, and a little bit of a backwards look at where I've been, and then a pivot to where I am going. And at the end of this, you're all invited. If some of you know me really well and have eaten dinner at my house and have been to all the AVA functions and know me, you know, when I have my pajamas on under my raincoat and I go back to work at one in the morning, some of you don't know that. So at the end of this, I'd love to have you come and see the place that I make my work at in the studio, number 312. And you can sort of see when things are in a gallery like this, they're estranged from the tabletop and they're estranged from the tools and the flotsam and jetsam that cause them to be born to begin with. What's so great about being here is that it allows me as a maker to see that object more clearly and differently and without all of that excess. But usually people that get to know me want to see all of the stuff behind the creative act. So at the end of this, we'll wander up. But thank you for allowing me to have a show, uh, Ava, and all the staff for supporting and making hors d'oeuvres and you know, being there for press releases and getting the word out on Facebook. Because that it's like that's what the community part of this community gallery is about, is that we're all driving this creative stuff forward together. So I get a little choked up, it means a lot. Um I am predominantly known as a jeweler and a metalsmith. So you probably know as I turn this on. Me for um, work that looks like this, which are these big, five years ago I had a show here, and um, it was very much about line and form, but line that was made with three-dimensional form. Mostly out of metal, sometimes out of found objects. And there are sort of giant plants and seed pods that have gone awry that are very much based on my discipline of drawing. I'm a line straddler. I don't stay in any one camp for very long. I've, I love the activity of making and directly manipulating the materials that I work with. I love fire and flame a great deal. But I also love shadow and line and drawing and encaustics and painting. And because of my education, I think, and the disciplines I've known in, in my youth and past, those things continually inform what I'm doing with my metalwork. So these were the pieces that won the Niche Award um, two years ago. And it's called From Flower to Fruit. So my process as a thinker and a maker is to start with an idea, gather all of this stuff on the internet or in books or in botanical prints, do a bunch of crazy drawings, and then strip it away, strip it away, strip it away, until I come up with the actual volume and form that I'm after, so that the architecture of what I'm interested in saying or having someone see is the most present in the work. And I know Jewelry is kind of a funny place to put all this meaning because it's very small and it's easily overlooked. But what I'm really interested in is the intimacy of that gaze of the object and the feeling of it when it's being worn and when it's on the body. It's a very sensual, um, meaningful, private experience that then can be a public one when it becomes worn outside. What I do in my spare time is I plunder bookstores. I'm married to a very nerdy man who's a scientist that all, a lot of you know in this room, named Eric. And he is a passionate and diligent and addictive reader. 
And I'm, I'm sort of the same, not as much of a reader, but of a, as a looker and a taker inner of images. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But I collect the botanical prints, particularly ones from the 1890s to the 1920s, hand-colored um, etchings and offset lithos and chromolithos. So I have a bunch of things that are in my home and on my bookshelf and in collections of folios and books that I refer to. They're my friends, and I look at them and refer to them and steal parts of them, and then they turn into things like this, which are serving spoons that are informed by dandelions and cast flowers and so on. So the, the, the vegetable part <laughs> has to do with me taking a look very formally at botanical structures and then sort of figuring out that how that engineering in a plant can relate to the engineering that I'm doing as a metalsmith. And, and then the question of function and of body adornment is sort of usually sort of the tertiary concept that I'm working with from time to time. And my training as a, in grad school was that of a pewter smith and a silversmith. So I spent a lot of time making flatware and vessels and angle raised things, you know, hammering with headsets and large torches, which is why I'm so excited about our next development that's in the backyard here, because the scale that I usually work at as a jeweler here in this building has been somewhat confined by the space I work in because of the wooden structure that we're within. So the landscape can change, but these are the kinds of things that I plunder around looking for to collect. And then they end up in forming pieces like this. This is a long lariat of silver and gold. And I've broken down the line, the line, the line. The engineering is that of one single pivot point or a bald socket joint, which you see all over the place. I'm the daughter of an auto mechanic, so I, I have known socket joints my entire life since <laughs> my first pair of pliers, which came into my hand at the age of nine. So what I'm going for with something like this long lariat is the fluidity when it's actually on the body. And then when it's not on the body and it's on the hook, it gives you visual information about how I draw. So it's this sort of funny amalgam um, where I'm being exceedingly loose. Like, this is sort of sloppy metal work, really. But, you know, it probably wouldn't pass muster in the German school of metalworking because it's not highly polished. I, I'm breaking rules rather intentionally because I want it to look like graphite and not like a shiny piece of metal. So that's intentional on my part. And then I break it down even more and more and more. As a metalsmith, I'm usually confined by the color of the materials that I'm working with. Gray, black, white, yellow, pink. And then anything that I introduce that's color is usually a stone, a pearl. You know, 25 or more years of me working both as an independent jeweler and metalsmith and artist, as well as doing commission work, my materials kit um, is bead, stone, gold, silver, copper. I, I now am at a point where I don't have to really think uh, about how the material will react to me because I've had enough hand memory at this point to be able to make an aesthetic or an intellectual decision and anticipate how those materials move. And I think that when I it, that informs how I teach on a large level because I can see when someone is, else is a little bit tentative how the metal, I can anticipate before they do, how the metal is going to react in a teaching situation. So I'm very thankful that I've sort of walked the path with a very narrow um, set of materials and tools because it's given me the ability to kind of expand um, exponentially on a lot of the ideas that I have. Carl Blasfeld is somebody who I've spent, I'm fortunate enough to own his work, and I've spent a lot of time analyzing and looking at it. Um, he was, um, this is a photo of Revere, and he was in the Austrian and German education system, taught architecture, and 
the way he taught architecture was to give his students an assignment to look at botanical form and then talk about those structures with a lens of architecture. Smart man, good designer, and got amazing things out of his students as a result. So these photographs were not taken as art photographs. They were taken as documentation to hand to a student in a folio and make them think outside of their boxes of architecture, that things don't always have to be square or a cube. So again, tableware and flatware are, are um, something that I, I really love making because it changes the frame of reference of the, the scale and function of the piece as well as all the mucking around I can do because I'm working on a larger scale. And it doesn't have to have a body underneath it. It's its own entity. It has other rules like bowl and handle weight, length of handle, um, how big or, or small the bowl is. And I also can uh, reference uh, flatware and decorative arts history and use that as a springboard for some of my ideas. Um, a lot of the flatware I've currently been making has been broken down to a line, but the line pieces at the end that are on the finials of the spoons are articulated. So when you actually use the spoon, it moves and wiggles, and it sort of adds this element of play, of shadow and line, as well as um, kind of a sense of fascination. I spent a lot of time, this year I didn't, I'm a total loser in my garden, I didn't weed at all, but normally I'm more fascinated with the weeds in my garden than I am with the plants, because as I'm pulling them up and unfortunately eradicating them, I'm also looking at them and getting incredible ideas for how to change the line, or how to grow the volume, or what a seed pod really looks like up close. I'm waiting to hear back um, on these, if they're going to be part of the permanent collection, so I'll keep it posted. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> so the, the other part of me as an artist um, has to do with community, and community is usually around my table. Um, here it's, um, Ava provides me with a tremendous community, and I'm always cooking, and I'm always schlepping food here, and then I'm setting tables, and catering food. I should have been a caterer in another life. I should have had 10 children. But I don't, and I wasn't. <laughs> Carrie's laughing. So I'm always like, usually some random Thursday nights at my house, there's the truffle making materials come out or whatever. But what I think as a maker, why I enjoy this level of making as opposed um, maybe to my previous years as a painter or printmaking is that the function of the work that I make is also used by the community that I love. So it's sort of this funny way of I'm at the table along with uh, other people. So here's you know my standard table setting when Eric and I are eating or when people come over to eat. And it's, it's pretty basic, but my goal for many years has always been to have a home that has <coughs> everything in it is made either by me or someone I know. And apropos of that, these are the people that I get to eat with on a daily basis. And it's the power of what we make. You know, oh God, it's pretty cool. So I don't actually have to send Maureen Mills a postcard or Kit Cornell a thank you note because they're with me every day. You know, it's just, it's great. And in the creative economy, this to me is even more important because you love the <coughs> objects you live with even more. And you pause sometimes to think, wow, somebody actually made this. This is pretty amazing. So that's my diatribe of white craft and uh, the creative economy is important, which I digress. But um, when, when you're a jeweler, you spend a whole lot of time looking at the 52 facet brilliant but 63% diamond, just to the left. And on the right, you, you begin to think, 
because you only see what's on the left, what does the crystal actually look like and why are these things so valuable? So that's another reason why that's the mineral part. Um, I think I, I'm at a point where I've been re-evaluating what materials are and why we use those materials and what the buy-in is um, for materials to be precious. Is it precious because I say it's precious, or is it precious because De Beers told me it is? And I, I've always sort of pushed back on the concept of preciousness and intentionally have hammered the surfaces of my work and made people tilt their heads or look differently at things. So I'm really much more interested in the images on the right, which are mackle. Uh, the triangular one in the middle is a mackle diamond, and then the other five around it are various tetrahedral crystals that the diamond comes in raw. But then again, when you think about it, salt is the same shape as a diamond, and it's also the same crystal structure. Yet we assign not a great value to salt, but we do diamond. And sugar is the other. So I just think, hmm, maybe we should just take a look at the drawings of these things and ponder that for a little bit. So I spent a lot of time, um, the current body of work I'm working on are these particular crystals that are reinterpreted in various ways, some with color, some without, um, some large, some small. And the commonality of those crystals turn into pieces like this, which is over there on the wall. And that's, <laughs> one morning I was making toast and I looked down, I have these little salt bowls in my kitchen and I looked down and I was like, oh my God, Malden sea salt is the best design ever. <laughs> so there you go. Um, it became a necklace, and so those are based on, those are malden sea salt crystals for what it's worth. Now, there are scientists in the room that I have to give I have to give a shout out to Eric. I am fortunate enough to be partnered with a research scientist who is fairly open with me when he gets excited about a project. For example, he spent a lot of time in a greenhouse this weekend taking tissue samples of the this, this sneaky plant that's up in the greenhouse that um, Dartmouth had a lot of uh, press about, mm -hmm. um, the Morphalis plant. And we end up having these kind of funny discussions with each other about how to look at things and what to look at. And, and he sees things in terms of his research, but I'll go to a um, travel with him goes and does papers and stuff, and I'll sit in the audience and I'll listen to science papers. And, you know, the, the signal transduction of the blah, 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 I will go right over my head, and I'll be sucked into the fact that these folks that are passionately involved in what their science is also take really great photos. And they're looking at something because the cell wall is breaking down or the, the you know, the, the center of the cell isn't what isn't doing what it should be, or the signal transduction for ripening isn't happening. But I'm thinking, oh my God, that would make a great chain. Or look at that cell structure. What if I added red color to something and made it really giant? Would it change the frame of reference of how we look at biology? Would it, instead of you know thinking about whether or not the mitochondria are working? which is all very good, I'm glad they're doing that, but as an artist, I'm more inclined to you know, take my sketchbook out of my, out of my pocket and begin um, looking at tomato cells, which would be upper right, and the chains that are next to Margaret on the wall there are all interpretations of uh, some of Eric's early research that he did in Wisconsin that were all basically on um, how tomatoes ripen. So it's just funny how these oblique things can really spin your head around, and then you're like, look at that line quality. That's amazing. How can I make that without using 3D printing? I could 3D print that, but how can I fabricate that in a way that looks like I grew it? Mm -hmm. So then, of course, I do a lot of hiking and looking. I'm always looking down. Eric's always looking up. The dog is always barking. 
really <laughs> the three things that happen when we take a hike. But uh, I, I have another fascination with um, the fact that fungus are their own organisms, yet they provide these amazing <coughs> colors, attractant and, and deterrent colors, as well as structures that, you know, are unparalleled in terms of their beauty. And that these are also tied to, you know, food, dying, all sorts of um, natural medicines. So th these things become inspirations for my abstractions. And I do a lot of the reading behind it, the science reading behind it. Whether it shows up in the object or whether a, a viewer or a wearer knows that is somewhat inconsequential. Those are are tags that I need to motivate myself to be interested in making that next body of work and to hook on to something. So this is called a bark bracelet. It's based on birch bark structures. And then there's Honey and Hive, a series of lots and lots of bending with pliers and hand fabrication in terms of process, but the overall simplicity of the work is really what I'm after. I'm a stripper downer of things, and I want the essence of where that hive is and what goes on in there to show, and the fact that when it's worn, it's like a tattoo on you. This is a piece in the room. Coral structures. Um, this is a piece of sponge coral, and the pieces that are inside are what happens when you have reef degradation and the corals that we know that have been so popular, a lot of the materials that jewelers use actually create an unethical harvesting of things. And so I'm very cognizant and careful about ethical sourcing of materials as well as <coughs> um, thinking about what happens when there's no more elephants and we shouldn't use ivory or people are you know, bombing the heck out of the reefs around China. So those things really, in essence, don't need to be coming out of the oceans because we can actually, we have colors and enamel and powder coating that can mimic that. So this, this was a piece, these uh, sponge corals are from 1800 that I came to me via um, a client of mine. And it just, I think where we are now is where the empty pieces are, and where we were in the 1800s are where the coral actually is in the, in the neck pieces. So enter color in Paulette's life. I've been hanging around in the gray a lot, and my foray into, um, into encaustics is really what started this craving to have flat expanses of color on my work that was not attributed to a gemstone or any type of material that was mined. I mean, glass chemicals, and glass is ground, and the chemicals are mined, but I meant in terms of a gemstone. So these are ex color experiments that I do. So they're the front and back of the same group. And I return to drawing, I return to paper cutouts inspired by Matisse. <laughs> Whenever I'm trying to do something, it has to be on a thing that I understand. So these are all lifted from botanical prints and art history. But they're just a series of some successes and some failures of combinations of color. And then taken from biology, um, cell interactions with uh, Kumasi-inspired glue and then the back. Um, the wonderful thing about jewelry is that you can very, you can have a moment for whomever is wearing the piece if you're sensitive about the back of the piece as much as the front. And it becomes something that's an elegant surprise. And in this case, you can actually reverse the piece and wear the yellow side out. But I like being able to give that as a point of consideration when I'm working. And then these are <clears throat> also inspired from cellular drawings and um, Arabidopsis and tomato cells and um, the peacock blue and the sapphire blue in there is also um, torch fire enamel. 
Um, the glass is placed on a wet surface of either silver or copper, and then it's directly heated up to about 1,700 degrees with a torch. And it's this very, it's almost like painting in that I'm laying down a surface and I'm using my torch as the brush that then actually cures the glass onto the surface and makes it a permanent color on there. So this is any random day, any given day on my work, <coughs> what I'm working on. And here's my studio that I hope you will join me in taking a look at. And then here's my thank you to Ava. And thank you for allowing me to have a show here. I'm really honored to be able to have my work here as an artist, so thanks. questions and the other thing too is if these are all out for a reason that like most of the time jewelers put things under glass and I really wanted people this time through to be able to touch or really look closely without having to have that that block between them and the actual work so you can really get your nose in there but you're welcome to handle anything It's also, um, there's fungus and bark and cheese of the animals.